before we go into our third chapter of the knowledge of reckoning, it might be good for us to spend a moment together here on page 13 concerning Jacob. God's work with Jacob, as with us, he very patiently and thoroughly deals with us throughout our lives to move the center of our lives from self to the Lord Jesus, to himself. Move it from ourselves to himself. And it's, it's, a, it's a lifelong process. True, uh, Jacob was turned here in a single night, according to the word, but it was uh, many years bringing Jacob to this point. And then, of course, after this night, Jacob went on in a crippled condition, in a weakened condition. He was weak in Jacob, but he was strong in the Lord. Well, that's exactly how God deals with us. In this instance uh, concerning Jacob, uh, God uh, dealt with him basically through a physical handicap. He touched the hollow of his thigh and crippled him so that he, uh, he limped the rest of his life. And uh, as a reminder of his dependence upon God, no doubt. But it made him, uh, it made him not only physically but uh, spiritually dependent upon God. And, of course, God doesn't always deal with Christians through a physical means to turn them from self to the Lord Jesus. Uh, sometimes a Christian will be sick for a time. Sometimes God will heal him of his illness. Sometimes he won't. The illness is designed for a purpose, and when God has uh, uh, worked out his purpose through that illness, he'll take it away. Possibly, at times, it's his will to uh, have that illness continue on and that the Christian will not be healed or cured, as in the case of Jacob here. But if that is the case with the Christian, it's, it's because God is intending to continually use it for his development of that life. There are other ways, too, that God uses in our daily lives to deal with the old life and to develop a new. Uh, relationships, for instance, other types of uh, death, of suffering, where one is uh, in a home relationship that is very difficult and seeming seemingly uh, a binding and it keeps them from being active for the Lord, for instance, or able to get out with others. But God uses this for his specific purpose for that individual. And when he has his purpose completed, he, in his own way and time, will release that person from that pressure. So he has many different ways of doing this job of causing us to realize our weakness in ourselves as the platform for our realization of his strength in us. And of course, his strength in us is manifested for his glory, not for our use, not for us, but for him. We belong to him, and his purpose for us is centered in his Son. And all of the work within us of the Holy Spirit is for the sake of the Lord Jesus. And God wants our attitude, our heart attitude, to be for Jesus' sake. That all of this is for his sake. And uh, many Christians, of course, go on for years and years, uh, seemingly nothing ever happens to them. And they wonder why other Christians have such a hard time and uh, get all upset about things. And they just don't understand that. Why don't they be happy all the time like they are? Why don't they have it easy? 
so they think, well, maybe this Christian is floundering and he's not doing so well in the Christian life. He's not doing as well as I am. God is not blessing him. So that the Christian who is not yet being taken down into the pressures and the, the barren places, he doesn't understand the Christian who's having a hard time. So, uh, and of course, when he doesn't understand him, he's not able to help him. So that is right there is one of the penalties of having it easy all the time. You're not really able to help others and understand others, what they're going through. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, many Christians who are going through hard times and uh, deep waters, they can't understand why this other Christian uh, has things so easy. And they begin to wonder what's wrong, or why uh, God seems to be blessing them and he seems to be dealing harshly with uh, with us. But it's not really that way at all. It's God's wonderful dealing to make us more like the Lord Jesus. And the Christian who's going through things and the Christian who's experiencing uh, a daily death, so to speak, and is finding out more and more about himself, the sin of self, he's the one who's being prepared for growth. He's the one that God is dealing with in love. He's the one that's uh, making progress. Because the way up is down. The way of life is through death. Those are principles upon which God works. <coughs> so it's just simply more, uh, more proof that uh, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And his purpose, of course, is that the Lord Jesus might be made manifest in our lives, that we might be alive, that we might be conformed to the image of his Son. So we can praise the Lord, as he says in Thessalonians, in everything, in everything, we are to give thanks. For that is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us. Well, now here in <coughs> chapter 3 on page 14, we hear a lot today about the danger of uh, Christians having a lot of head knowledge. And uh, they know a lot, but they don't seem to experience much of what they know. And there are many Christians who uh, seem to avoid studying the Word and getting the knowledge about themselves and getting the knowledge about God that is, is needed for growth. And they pretty much uh, center their attention and uh, hopes upon uh, experiences and blessings. And they have uh, quite a bit to testify about, but when it comes to knowing about the Word and uh, basing what they're going through on the Word, <clears throat> they're not able to do it. <clears throat> well, this has the whole thing reversed. The way that God works is that he teaches us in the Word through our mind. The Christian has a mind that the Holy Spirit uses. And we're to think, and we're to study, and we're to come to understand and to realize the truth of the Word become rational, dependable Christians through knowing the facts of life. And through that knowledge, God works that knowledge down into our heart through everyday experiences so that we come in time to have heart knowledge, come to have a reality of experience. But it must be based upon the truth of the Word and in our knowledge our understanding. <clears throat> In that way, we know what God is doing with us and we're able to trust Him more definitely. We also are able to share these things with others in a clear-cut way so that we become usable servants of God because we know and because we do know, we are progressively experiencing that which we know. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ is our life. We count ourselves to be alive unto God in Christ. 
and the Lord Jesus more and more fully takes over in our walk and he's more and more definitely manifested in our lives now let's see just how important this head knowledge is we think of our foundation in Christ here on page 16 point one here born anew in Christ born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever first Peter 1 23 a Christian is badly crippled if he doesn't have the assurance of his salvation if he doesn't know that he's born again once he believes and that he's born into Christ in uh, the Lord Jesus who lives forever uh, years and years ago probably back in our grandparents days and before that there were many dear godly Christians but one thing about it all was that very few of them had uh, real assurance of their salvation and they they thought it was presumptuous to be able to say well I know I know I'm saved I know I'm eternally saved in Christ they they were almost afraid to think that out loud and many of them didn't know so that back there uh, we had the days of the great evangelists and the great the great preachers and most of the work was carried on by them there wasn't so much uh, witnessing and personal work as there is today the dear Christians that relied upon their church life and uh, the big meetings uh, to get the work done and most of it was caused most of that weakness was caused by their not really enjoying the full assurance of our salvation they were not able to stand up and say thus saith the Lord I know that I am saved and eternally secure in him and that crippled their that caught that uh, gave them less to witness about and they were not very effective in personal work in those days so that it isn't only important for our own well-being and growth it's important for our service of sharing with others born anew in Christ that we know that we're born again that we have the life of the Lord Jesus for our Christian life and point two is a very important important point and a point that uh, all too few Christians are clear about today and that is our acceptance in Christ that we as born-again Christians are accepted in the beloved that our Father fully accepts us because we are in Christ. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in His Beloved Son, Ephesians 1, 6. And the work that God did on the cross is so complete. He so thoroughly dealt with our sin, <clears throat> and He so thoroughly dealt with us as sinners, and he so completely placed us in his son born anew dead to the old alive to the new that the just and holy God our father is able to love us completely and eternally he's able to fully accept us in his very presence because we are in his son and because his perfect son his beloved son is our life the source of our life and our relationship to God is predicated upon our relationship to the Lord Jesus and God our father sees us in his son and he wants us to see ourselves in his son he wants us to see our position in him so that we're not all upset 
and all taken up with our self-life, which God had dealt with, but that we're taken up and we're abiding in, taken up with and we're abiding in the Lord Jesus, who is our Christian life. So many Christians are all upset about themselves that they're in no condition to rejoice in the Lord Jesus and pay attention to Him. And uh, so many Christians feel, well, I'm not acceptable. How can God accept me the way I am? Well, He can accept us in ourselves. He, 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 he never accepts us in the self-life, in the old life. That life He dealt with at Calvary. That's why He took us down to death, because it was completely unacceptable. That the old life is enmity toward God. There's no possible reconciliation there. So God did away with it in death, and he created us anew in his Son, the one that he can accept, the one that he fully accepts. And that's how God sees us. And as to the praise of the glory of his grace, we're in death, miss except in the in work. God sees it, wants us to realize that that's our position. That's our acceptance. And that's the only way that we can honor him, is to believe what he says and to see the situation as he sees it. One, three. All of these truths are interlocked. They're all built one upon the other. These are aspects of our foundation, the foundation of our Christian life. Point three, eternally secure in Christ. That our life is hid with Christ in God and our new life cannot be touched by anything or anyone. It's hidden with the Lord Jesus, who is safely in his Father, in glory with the Father. And as we grow, we're going to find out that we're living in heaven, in the Lord Jesus, right now. That's where our life comes from. And we abide there, and we rejoice there, and we have fellowship with him there, through the word, and then we are sojourners here. We come, so to speak, we come each day to this world and we walk through this world and uh, carry on the king's business in this world for the sake of others and for his glory. And all the process of it is for our spiritual growth and development. But that our home right now is in glory. Uh, before the throne, in the light. That's what he's going to teach us. That's what we need. That we're not uh, living down here and uh, hoping that God will bless and pleading God to bless and look way up everywhere trying to get God to pay attention to us and we hope that he'll uh, do things for us. No, not at all. It's just the opposite. We. Uh, find out these facts uh, that God has already done everything for us and he's already placed us in his son and that's where he sees us and that's where he fellowships with us and we with him right before his throne and then we have the privilege of uh, camping in this world and serving him here and him using us here for the sake of this lost world So these are foundational truths. These are the facts upon which our Christian life is built. That we're born into the Lord Jesus and that God accepts us in Him and that we're eternally secure in Him forever. His life is forever. And that there's no end. All because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did at Calvary. All because of what He is now in glory and all because of our relationship, our identification with him, where he is. We're already in heaven. That's the source of our life. Christians uh, think, well, so many Christians think, well, when I die, uh, I have to cross the dark stream and uh, finally get into glory, wake up in glory, but no, uh, the Christian is already in glory, and there's no death for the Christian. The Christian has already died in Christ, and now he's eternally alive in him. We died in Christ back at Calvary. There's no death for a Christian. When the Christian closes his eyes in what we call death, why, he's instantly 
uh, he's instantly in glory. He's with the Father, where he's been living all the time. But now he's there in experience. There's no gap. There's not even a flicker of an eyelash uh, gap because he's already there. And uh, death simply releases him from here in this body, and uh, he's instantly aware that he's uh, before the Father. And so it's not experiencing death, actually. It's experiencing life in its fullness. True, uh, if a Christian uh, dies today, he doesn't yet have his glorified body, but he's with the Lord, absent from the body, with present with the Lord. It's very comforting to realize that death is a release, death is an instant realization, full realization of our position in the Lord Jesus Christ before the throne. Nothing to fear, nothing to wait for. It's just a realization. And the Christian who is living his Christian life in glory now and uh, fellowships with the Father and with the Lord Jesus Christ up there. He has all the less to uh, be concerned about about death. He, he just realizes that he will be all the more f free to uh, enjoy this fellowship. He won't be uh, hampered by the things of this world and by this as yet unredeemed body. <coughs> So you can see how all of this, as we grow, it's simply uh, preparation for eternity. Now there's this fourth point on page 17, positioned in Christ, where God has already placed us. God hath quickened and lifed us together with Christ, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2, 4-6. And that's what happened when we uh, were, after we were crucified with the Lord Jesus, uh, we died on Calvary with him unto sin, and we were raised together in him on resurrection ground. And then when the Lord Jesus Christ arose and ascended into glory, he took every Christian with him. And the Holy Spirit came down here to make these truths real to us here, that our position is in the Lord Jesus at the Father's right hand, hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And as we abide in the Lord Jesus Christ, if, uh, if we're going to abide in him, we're, going to, we're just going to realize that, uh, well, where is he? Well, he's in glory. Well, if we're abiding in Him, we're abiding in the glorified Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. That's where we're abiding. And that's the source of our life. Well, now, these truths that we've been thinking of briefly, we'll touch on them again as we go along. These are foundational truths. These are the root of the matter. These are truths that have to do with us as we're in the vine, the source of our life. These are not growth truths, but these are the ground truths, so to speak, out of which our Christian life and upon which our Christian life will develop. The Christian who is assured of his birth on the basis of the Word of God, the Christian who knows that in Christ God loves us, he's fixed by the earth. Even when he's going through all the process of finding out about self and sin and learning of his weaknesses and his sinfulness, even during all that process, God accepts him in his Son. That's what helps the Christian get through all of this when he realizes that he is in Christ acceptable. Uh, how about our children? Or our friends who come to us for counsel and they tell us about things about themselves, for instance. And we 
are able to understand and we're able to love them regardless of what they tell us and what we see that they are that they realize that we accept them as they are that therapy that uh, basis of relationship is necessary for uh, in order for us to help them in any way in order for them to uh, allow us to help them in order for them to be uh, helpable they must have this assurance that they're accepted children go through many things especially in their teens where the one anchor for them is that mom and dad uh, understand and uh, mom and dad love them still and mom and dad accept them as they are that's the basis upon which they're able to get through these areas of pressure <coughs> And the exact, the, the very same uh, principle is, it works out in our Christian life. That the Christian who knows that he's accepted in Christ by the Father is a Christian who will uh, be able to get through the difficult areas in his life and grow. But when he is not aware of his being accepted and he thinks that God rejects him because of the way he finds out that he is, finds himself to be, he is discouraged, he is taken down into depression, blackness and darkness. And he, how can he exercise faith when he's in that condition? How can he trust his father when he's in that condition? How can he count upon the truth when he's feeling that way? It, it isn't possible. Acceptance in Christ is a key foundation block for our spiritual growth. <clears throat> and then, of course, assurance and acceptance pave the way for the Christian to realize that he's secure. He's unconditionally secure in the Lord Jesus because he's been born into him. It isn't a matter of certain conditions. If he does his part, he holds his, uh, his end up. If he uh, stops sinning and all that, that he, he'll be sure of heaven. No, it's not that he'll know that he's secure. It's not on that basis at all. It's on the basis of who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what he's done and our relationship to him, that he's our life, that we've been born into him and that we're accepted. There is our security. And the Christian who is aware and sure of his security is a Christian who will mature because he knows that uh, no matter what he has to find out about himself, no matter what God has to take him through, it does not have any effect upon his foundation. It has no effect whatsoever upon his relationship with God. True, it may have a lot of effect. That can be uh, straightened out through the cleansing of the blood, through our confession, through our growth. But none of these things has anything to do with our eternal relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ and our eternal security in our Father. And because we are born anew, because we are accepted in the Beloved, because we are secure in Christ, on that basis God is able to position us in Christ and we are raised together with Him and we are Seating, seated in Christ in glory now because of all this because of what God has done <coughs> God hath given us life he has quickened us together with Christ when the Lord Jesus Christ rose again from the dead we were born anew into him and given new life uh, we exchanged the old Adamic life for the life of the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, right now. But this Adam is a cut off from death. He created us. We were born in the Lord Jesus in direction, in his resurrected, ascended, eternal life. That's what we say. <coughs> he has to get Christ and has he's up to get us in the message in Christ Jesus. Now these are facts us, and these are the facts that God wants us to count upon, to reckon upon. Reckon ye also yourselves 
to be alive unto God in Christ Jesus. And where is Christ Jesus? He's at the Father's right hand. And we're alive and accepted by God in His beloved Son, His beloved risen Son. Now, <clears throat> we are to know these things. We are to see them and understand them as we study. Head knowledge. We don't experience these things first. We come to know them, that they are true of us because we're in the Lord Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit, as he gives us this knowledge, then it's his ministry to cause us to grow. And as we grow, we begin to ignore. we begin to experience the risen life of the Lord Jesus here upon this earth. The risen, victorious life of the Lord Jesus Christ down here in this sin-sick world. So that when it comes to growth, we rest upon this foundation of these four points. And because this is our foundation, then we come to see that we are complete in the Lord Jesus. We are already complete in Him. Colossians 2, 9 and 10 on, on page 17 here. For in Him, for in the Lord Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him. The Lord Jesus Christ is a perfect representative of God. He's God in the flesh when he was here on earth. He that has seen me, he that seeth me has seen the Father. He was God's representative here on earth. And then he went back to glory to be with the Father in his new body, in his glorified body, human body. And uh, his perfect human nature and his perfect divine life are merged forever. That the Lord Jesus Christ is in glory now as a man. As he left this earth. That is the way he is in glory. Our human nature renewed as we're born again in him receive a new nature, divine nature. It's human and divine. And that's the way we are in Him, complete in Him. The human and divine Lord Jesus Christ. He partook of our nature that He might take us up into glory. He gave us His nature and He took our nature. So that we as redeemed human beings are able to live in glory because we have the divine life, we have the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. Now, we come to realize that the Lord Jesus Christ is our life, and that he is our completed life. He is the vine so that <clears throat> we see here in 1 Corinthians 1.30 Of God are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification, growth and redemption our completed salvation so that all that we need in our Christian life is centered in the Lord Jesus and we're centered in Him. He's our life. So that as we grow, our attitude is to be, what the Lord, what God is going to make of me <coughs> in my Christian life, He is drawing from my Savior, my Lord, and my life. That the Lord Jesus might be manifested in my mortal body. And that whatever He wants to use me for, 
whatever ministry he may have for me, <coughs> he's going to build it upon that life of the Lord Jesus. And it's going to be the result of the life of the Lord Jesus in and through me. So that <coughs> our faith is in him and his finished work, and we rely upon him to take us through all the things that are required for the development of his purpose in us. Some of them are very difficult things. Some of them are have the aspect of death. But all of us, death leads to life. There may be a lot of training involved. He may have us go off to school, go to Bible school, Bible college, or whatever it is, technical training. He gives us the assurance as to what to do. But along with all of this training, there is his personal development of our Christian life. Because if we are simply trained to serve the Lord, and if our Christian life is not developed, uh, God uh, cannot really use that training. Because there will not be the reality behind it of the Lord Jesus. There will not be the freedom of the Holy Spirit to work through us in utilizing this training. So that actually, <coughs> one of the reasons for fa failure and the failure in our early Christian life, uh, didn't realize that these foundation truths are not. But then, growth comes from added truths, further truths. Uh, justification is for birth, and identification is for growth. And we wondered why we floundered so after our beginnings, and it was simply because we uh, didn't know enough about the truths that are given to us for growth, our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, his death and resurrection. So we, what, we, what happened to us was that we had uh, we'd run out of, uh, we'd gone beyond our truth, we'd gone beyond our teaching. We were seeking to grow, and all we knew were, were the foundation truths. So what the Lord does, he lets us flounder for a time until we become hungry and see our need, and then uh, he takes us on and introduces us to the truths that have to do with growth. And that's uh, those are the truths that we introduced uh, to many in the green letters were the, the growth truths. And uh, those are the truths that we're thinking of in, the, in this book, in the Reckoning book, are growth truths. But uh, one of the tragic things in Christian circles these days is that many Christians are seeking to grow when they're not yet really established in their foundational truths. They're running ahead. And... Uh, there are many Christians who are seeking to reckon when they're not really sure that they're secure in the Lord and they don't know very much about the fact that they're accepted in Him. They don't realize uh, very definitely their position in the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't realize where they are. They don't realize that they're uh, seated with Christ in the heavenly places before the very throne of God. And yet they're, they're seeking to reckon themselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God in Christ. Whereas a Christian, uh, he can't reckon himself to be dead into sin until he, is, uh, until he knows that he did die at Calvary, in Christ on Calvary. And he cannot reckon himself uh, alive unto God in Christ until he knows that he is in Christ in glory. Reckoning has to be based upon uh, the knowledge of the truth. So that is what God is seeking to teach many Christians now, is uh, first be sure of your foundation, and on that basis there will be growth and there will be uh, progress in the truths that lead to maturity, truths that we can reckon upon. So down at the bottom of page 18 here we have these uh, pillars of knowledge, things that a Christian should know. Uh, 
as a basis for growth. The first pillar is uh, the knowledge of our new birth, that we're assured that we're born again, and the knowledge that we are accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the knowledge that we're secure in Him forever. And that's the first pillar of our foundation. And until the Christian is sure of these uh, three points in his first pillar, why he, he's not going to make progress in growth. He cannot. Because he because he's not uh, he he doesn't have the ground to stand upon. He's going to flounder his, his, from one experience and one so-called blessing to another for his whole Christian life. He's just going to flounder. He's not going to be firm and established in the responsible Christian. And he's certainly not going to be able to uh, uh, be a help to other Christians or even a help to the unsaved without this knowledge without knowing these aspects of his acceptance in the Lord Jesus and his position in him and his security in him. And then the second pillar of his foundation, of our foundation, is the knowledge of uh, the Lord Jesus' uh, cross and the fact that that cross is our cross. Well, every Christian knows that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for his sins paid the penalty of his sins, uh, he had to know that in order to become a Christian. To trust the Lord Jesus as his own personal Savior and accept him as such. He had to know that. He had to have that knowledge. But uh, in order for him to grow and to develop and to become uh, more and more conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has to uh, come to see in the Word that uh, the cross that the Lord Jesus Christ died on is uh, is a Christian's cross, is our, our personal cross too. Because that cross at Calvary 2,000 years ago is a cross upon which every Christian died too in Christ. So that's our cross. And when uh, the Lord Jesus in John and Luke says that we are to take up our cross and follow him, this is a cross that we take up and you take it up by faith. That I realize that I died on that cross and I, I reckon myself to, be, to have died unto sin in Christ Jesus. That's taking up the cross. And as we count upon that fact and, and take up the cross in that manner by faith, the effect of the cross, the crucifixion of the cross, begins to be applied in our daily life. For we which live are always delivered unto death. And uh, self is crucified daily within our very hearts <coughs> because we've taken up our cross by faith and said yes Lord Jesus I believe that I died there and I want to be freed from the dominion of sin and from the domination of the self life and I take up the cross upon which I was self was crucified and I count upon that fact and as we believe the Holy Spirit takes that fact and makes it real in our daily walk all way delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, so that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our mortal body. That's an aspect of uh, the fact that's, that's taking up our cross. That's the fact that uh, his cross is our cross. And that's knowledge that we need. We need to know that. That where he died, we died. And uh, our cross is not a matter of uh, difficult situations in the home or the work or that we say we have a cross to bear. No, not at all. Our cross is the specific, specific cross upon which the Lord Jesus and we died. And taking up that cross may uh, cause difficult situations in the home or the work. Because the self to be crucified, the cross will be applied to our lives. That's the picture of real over counting and reckoning upon his on taking our cross. And actually, uh, the cross is the, the central aspect of our Christian life. Because uh, at the cross, we were cut off from the old sinful life, cut off from the first Adam in death. And at the cross, uh, 
when we died upon the cross and were buried and uh, rose again in Christ, that's the very place that we were renewed in him and given a new life. So that the cross is the watershed, it's the central aspect of our Christian experience. The cross is the cause of being done and the cause of our being with Lord Jesus Christ. So we never uh, leave the cross, actually. We, we have the, the effect of us lives every day. All of the Jesus uh, and the cross as we hunger and cry, we do uh, heal and more free sin. Our our life. We will have the cross as any uh, fat and free from this life and be glorious, that's freedom. And we constantly be dead and dead as at us. We heal and glorify the very, very crosses and, and cross of this experience is us we glory in. And the cross is the only uh, power that can free us from the world and the world and the world unto us. And when we become uh, concerned about this world and uh, its effect upon our Christian lives, and we want to be free from its effects, and free to uh, live in Christ, and experience the Lord life of Jesus Christ to you. Live in this Lord. We're freed from the uh, power of this world, the whose, uh, whose um, leader is Satan, God of this world. Uh, we're freed from the influence of this world by the work of the cross in our lives. Because at Calvary we were crucified unto this world, and the world was crucified unto us. And get the effect of the cross in our daily life here. More and more from the world. More and more freed from the cross. More and more free to abide in the Lord. That's the work of the cross. So this second pillar is uh, extremely important uh, for our knowledge that we might know what happened to us at Calvary. <coughs> and then, of course, the third pillar is uh, follows in place, and that is the knowledge that we know that we are alive and complete in our risen Lord Jesus Christ. We know our position in Him. And we count upon that fact. Uh, he is more and more free to manifest his risen life in us in our daily walk. Of the not I, but Christ's life. And of course, uh, we come to know that God is working all of these things together that happen to us, that we might be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be more and more like the Lord Jesus. I remember an illustration that has to do with our the process of our growth of our knowledge of our life in Christ being made experiential here and now. I like to call it the uh, spiritual catfish illustration where the story is that off the coast of England, there is a place where there is a great amount of herring. Fishermen uh, seem to be able to uh, get unlimited amounts of herring out there. And when they first discovered this area many years ago, they would bring the fish in to market and uh, Many of them died on the way in and on. Uh, they weren't too marketable. They were, they lost a lot of their flavor. <coughs> so that finally one of the fishermen um, built large uh, tanks and vats on his, his fishing boat. And when he would catch these herring, he would put them in the water in the tanks and they would stay alive until he got them into the market, and so they sold much better. <coughs> but these fishermen noticed uh, in time that there was one particular uh, boat that seemed to sell all of its fish first, 
and everyone uh, seemed to go there and uh, for the the best herring. He made the most sales, and they wondered how uh, how this was. They couldn't uh, find out his secret for m being able to market the, the finest herring, best flavored herring. And finally they found out what his secret was. He had uh, tanks just as they had and they brought them in alive. But what he did <coughs> was that he would uh, put one or two catfish in each of the tanks. And catfish are supposed to eat herring. So he was willing to lose a few herring as the catfish uh, kept these tanks full of herring on the move as they were seeking to escape constantly. By the time he came into market, his fish were all <laughs> very much alive, except for the few that the catfish ate, very much alive, and they'd been kept in constant motion, and uh, they were practically ocean fresh when they were presented to the buyers. Well, <coughs> this is just a little picture of uh, God's spiritual catfish. And uh, there are many Christian women, for instance, today who, well, many of them were Christians before they were married, and maybe not too strong in the Lord, and uh, some of them might have been a little careless as to the type of man they married, type of Christian they married. And uh, it's been a difficult time ever since, maybe becoming more and more difficult for them. And God uses all of this for their spiritual development, this uh, process of death and agony and worry and concern and uh, heartache. He's using it all for their development. It's a spiritual catfish that God has placed in their tank. And uh, all too many of these dear folk resist the situation with might and main and at the top of their voices. And uh, instead of seeking to rest in the Lord Jesus and realize what's going on, and seeking to allow the Lord Jesus to manifest himself in them and ultimately either win the husband or cause him to be hungry to grow, Instead of this, they have uh, fought the situation and struggled to rectify it and straighten their husbands out and uh, constantly after him to become a better Christian or if he's not a Christian, to become a Christian and they've only driven their husbands farther and farther away. And they haven't realized uh, that God's hand is in all this and uh, that God will get great glory out of it all and they make a stronger Christian out of uh, each one in time if they realize what's going on. <coughs> and then, of course, there are situations where dear Christian parents have children and they want to have their Christian home and raise their children as Christians for the Lord, and they find it almost impossible to maintain a family altar or to maintain discipline in the home, especially these days, the way things are at school and even at church. And, uh, of course, they make the mistake of bringing a feeling that they're forced to bring a TV into the home because the children will only go next door and watch it anyway, and besides, they want to see some of it themselves, maybe not at first so much, but uh, the world has power, great power. That's why God had to crucify us under it and the world under us, because uh, Satan's word, world is a very powerful factor, and the self-life responds to the world because that's its habitat, that's its element. So many dear Christian parents are suffering untold agony about their family, about their Christian home, about their children. 
and uh, some of them uh, just more or less give up and let the situation go from bad to worse, and others seek to rectify it uh, with might and main. Whereas there is a balance there of a Christian re uh, parent, uh, Christian parent, parental responsibility, and uh, geared to uh, dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and that these uh, children see Christ in them. And uh, there's the factor right there that the Lord Jesus Christ might be manifested in that home, right in the middle of all of the heartache and agony. He's the one who will draw the children to himself. Uh, many of the children, maybe at Sunday school or uh, at home, have been uh, one to the Lord. Sometimes they've been pushed into all this. And then the parents wonder why they don't develop as teenagers, as uh, good, strong Christians. Whereas uh, <coughs> so often they've been t uh, pushed into things that they're not ready for. And itself is uh, sought to do the job that only the Holy Spirit can do. So there's a tragic there, a tragedy there. Uh, but even so, ultimately in time, as the parents wait upon the Lord, these children will uh, uh, come to themselves and that they will uh, turn to the Father. And they'll come to appreciate their parents in time after they see something of what they're like in themselves. And uh, often it, it has to go until uh, they become parents themselves and begin to realize what it's all about, that they begin to appreciate their own parents. So uh, God uses the home like he uses nothing else to crucify the self-life and to uh, give us the conditions under which... Uh, there is death, that out of this death, the new life in the Lord Jesus Christ might be manifest, because all resurrection life must spring out of death. Death to the old and life in the new. So it's the same old principle that the very catfish that would uh, that just seems to pursue us unto death is the very element that God has uh, released upon us in order that we might grow in Christ, in order that the Christian life for us might be not I, but Christ. And uh, these catfish may be the very thing that uh, God uses to gobble up the self-life, but uh, through that freedom from the self-life, uh, we uh, begin to enjoy the reality of the Christ life. So, dear friends, we have much to thank the Lord for. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. First Thess Thessalonians 5.18 So we can thank God for his spiritual catfish. We can thank God that all things are working together for our good that we might be conformed to the image of his Son. Our Father, <coughs> we praise thee for thy patience with each one of us. That we go year by year uh, finding out what we need to know that we might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his reality. So we rest in thee and wait upon thee for thy development and we thank thee in advance, in Jesus' name, amen.